So page 7, question 15. Which pair of forces acts only as a couple on the circular object? So as I mentioned to you, couple has a specific characteristics to it. Looking at these four answer choices, which one do you think is actually the couple? Um, I remember that couple had a few characteristics. Couple must be equal for opposite. I think it's A. Yes, correct. Couple must be equal for opposite forces separated by distance. So yes, answer is A. You see equal opposite and separated by distance. B is wrong because not equal magnitude. And then C is wrong. Yeah, uh, B is wrong, not equal magnitude and also not opposite direction. C is wrong because not equal magnitude. Then D is wrong because they are not even parallel. Yeah. When you say that the forces are equal but opposite that force, uh, when you say the couple is equal but opposite forces, the part where they are opposite forces, oppositely directed already means that they are parallel. So this one is not parallel, this one is up. So answer for this is just A. Okay, so this one is a couple. Now, can you have a look at page 41? Question 13. A, B. 41, 41, yeah. 41, question 13. Okay, you have a rigid circular disk of radius R that has its center and X. A number of forces of equal magnitude F act on the edge of the disk. All the forces are in the plane of the disk. Which arrangement of forces provides a moment of magnitude 2fr about x. Which of these choices here gives you a moment of magnitude 2fr about x? The x here is your period. So, Maybe give, give it a minute. See which one is the answer. You can try and calculate out the moments for each of these individual uh, choices. Your period is the center. Your distance is your R. So let me know which answer is it once you're done. One of these is a couple. This one is a couple.
is it A? So. Yep, answer is A. Okay, answer for this is A. I mean, here you can already see that this is a couple, right? Because equal opposite force separated by distance. Your distance here is actually 2R because you have two times the radius, all right? So this one here, moment, is actually force times 2R giving you 2FR. This one is correct. Now, if I ask you to find out the moments for the rest of the answer choices, this one would just be FR. Then the part C would be, you see this one is going this way in terms of the rotation. This one is going this way in terms of the rotation. The moment is actually zero, but if you want to calculate out, you can. This one is F, this one is R, this one is R, but because the opposite direction, you'll be FR minus FR equals zero. Now, if you look at the last answer choice, this one will be R, this one will be R, and then this one will be R. This one and this one are in same direction. This one opposite. So your moment will be FR plus FR minus FR giving you just FR. So you see none of these are equivalent to 2FR other than A. Okay. So this is the basics. Okay, now I move on to something a bit more complicated. I go on with say page 26. Ah, okay. Right. It's like a rehash of the examples that I've done, but Let's see whether do you get it. I'll go to page 26, question 17, this one. All right. You have a rigid cross-shaped structure having four arms, P, O, S, O, Q, O, R, O, each one meter long, that's pivoted at point O. The forces act on the ends of the arms and on midpoints on the arms as shown. What is the magnitude of the resultant moment on the structure about O? Okay, they want the resultant moment about O. This is your P word. Okay. So maybe this one I'll give you about two or three minutes to do. There is a complicated way to go about this. There's also an easy way, but let's just see first how you do this. Okay, so let me know once you have an answer. Doesn't matter if it's wrong, just give me an answer once you're done. Then I'll explain to you.
is it C still? Okay, is it C? Right, let's just move from here. Yes, the answer is C. Okay, so far so good. Okay, now let me ask you, is there any trick to doing this? Did you sum up the moments of all the forces one by one? Yeah, I did. Okay, did you use anything like the moment of a couple equation? Do you try to identify whether there are any couples in this? No, you know, like when you are explaining the notes, then you you like did the whole thing for each moment, right? Yeah. That's how I did it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so you, you see that when I did the moments for each of the forces, that one is okay. But if it's a couple, you notice that the method was probably redundant, isn't it? Like yeah. the ones that I show you here just now, uh, over here, this one. You will notice that, yeah, if I wanted to find the moment caused by a couple, I can find out the moment one by one. But then it seems to be a bit more tedious, like there's more steps there. If I had identified it as a couple in the first place, I could have just straight away take the force multiplied by the perpendicular distance between them, right? That was what I tried to show here like, just now, okay? So yeah, there's nothing wrong with you calculating the moments one by one. You will eventually get back the same answer. But the thing is that for paper one, time is a bit short because you see you have 40 questions and one hour, 15 minutes. One question is not supposed to take more than two minutes, okay? So there are some shortcuts here that you can do. This one I will show you. Okay, so let me just move it off. Okay, first thing first, you can identify couples. What are the couples here? If you remember, I mentioned to you, couples are a pair of forces, equal magnitude, opposite direction, but separated by distance. You see here, there are actually a few couples. The 70 Newton force is one couple. The 50 Newton force is one couple. And then after that, there are no more couples other than the 50 Newton and the 70 Newton force. So there are actually two couples here. The 70 Newton couple and the 50 Newton. Basically, you have the 50 Newton and 70 Newton. Couple. Okay, now the 17 Newton couple will give you rotation counterclockwise. The 15 Newton couple will give you rotation clockwise. So let's just say when you wanted to add up the moments together, all right, uh, say you want to add up the moments, you consider clockwise as being positive here, all right. The 15 Newton will be considered as positive. Move couple for you. The 70 Newton will be considered as negative. Okay. Now then another thing here that you can do to further simplify your calculation is identify any moments that cancel out. There are actually, there's actually two moments that will, there's actually two forces whose moment will cancel out here. If you look at the 20 Newton forces, this 20 Newton and this 20 Newton, notice that they are equal magnitude and also same distance away because this one, the question mentioned that they're either acting at the ends of the arms or midpoints of the arms. So this distance here is actually the same as this distance here. Okay. So these two moments, the 20 Newton, this one on the right will give you clockwise. The 
20 newton on the left will give you anti-clockwise. They actually cancel off. So identify any moments that cancel off the 20 newton moments. So this one will go cancel off. Now, what are the other remaining moments here? You will see that there's actually the 30 newton. What color should I use? Okay, you see that there's actually the I'll use blue. Look. You see that there's a 30 newton force here that's not accounted for, and a 30 newton force here that's not accounted for. This 30 newton is actually not a couple. The moments won't cancel off, and they are not a couple because you see they're not parallel. Okay, this one you notice that it's going this way, it's going this way. So their moment is counterclockwise. This will be negative. And then this one will be negative. So now when I want to add out the moments, I will need to add out this moment and also for that of the couple. All right, so my calculation would look something like this. This one would be negative 30 times 0 0.5 negative 30 times 0 0.5 okay this is for the first 30 newton and then if i talk about the couples the couples that i have the 50 newton okay i go with the 70 newton the 70 newton is also negative it's minus 70 times the perpendicular distance this one is one meter this one is also one meter so it's negative 70 times 2 for the couple. And then after that, the last couple I have is the 50 Newton. But this one is positive. So it's plus 50 times with 1. Because here I notice that it's 0 0.5. Here is also 0 0.5. So let's see whether we get the same answer. Negative 30 times 0.5 times 2. Minus 70 times 20 plus with 50. Okay, so you get negative 1, 2, 0 Newton meter. Okay, 30 times 25 is 2, negative the answer minus 1, 2, 0 plus with. I think the correct answer is that sorry. Yeah, I'm getting 120 newton meter. Okay, so this is another way of doing the same thing, which may be easier. But if you want to do it one by one, it's also fine. Okay, so there's a shortcut here. I just want to highlight this. Okay. Okay. Identify any couple, then identify any moments that cancel off. So 20 newton moments cancel. Right, so this one, 20 newton moments cancel out. Okay. Right, so that one is okay. Then we go to the last one, which is on page 36, question 11. Okay, have a look at page 36. Okay. Now this one might be easier compared to what you've just done just now. Right, page uh, 36, question 11. In a machine, many couples act on a rotating object as shown. All right, what's the resultant torque acting on the rotating object? So this one, as I mentioned to you, when it comes to couples, don't really need to bother about where the pivot is or how, how it's situated. You really only need to bother about the perpendicular distance between the forces. Okay, so this one, let me just clear off everything. Now, what is the resultant torque acting on the rotating object? Now, you notice that all the things here are actually couples. Let me just indicate for you using the colored lines. 25 Newton, 25 Newton is a couple. 16 Newton and 16 Newton is a couple. 
30 newton and 30 newton is a couple and then lastly 50 newton and 50 newton is a couple you have in total four different couples here so you want to get your moment you just add up the couples together a uh, resultant torque sorry resultant torque So oh, let me just write it out. Okay, since us or since when we always use clockwise as our sign convention, we're always getting negative. Let's just change the sign convention a little, see whether we get positive now. We make counterclockwise positive now. All right. The 25 Newton force is causing counterclockwise rotation. So it's positive. The 16 Newton force again is also causing counterclockwise rotation. So it's positive. The 30 Newton force is causing clockwise rotation. So by right, it is negative. And then the 15 Newton force is causing counterclockwise rotation. So it's positive. So let's just add them all up. For the 25 Newton force, your perpendicular distance between the forces is this entire length. If from radius, uh, if from the center to here is 12, that means your perpendicular distance is twice that value. So it will be 24. Yeah. This one is 24 centimeter, but please make sure to change it to meter because the final answer is in meter. So this is 0 0.24 meter. So this one is 25 times 0 0.24. How about the 16 Newton force? 16 Newton force again is positive. But what is the perpendicular distance between the 16 Newton force? Sixteen Newton to the center is ten centimeter. Double that value will be twenty centimeter. So it's sixteen times zero point two. Next, we go to the 13 Newton. The 13 Newton is negative. But what is the perpendicular distance between the forces? Which is given by this. From here to center is 6.5 multiplied by 2. You're going to get 13. So this is 0 0.13 meter. This is 0 0.13. Okay. Then the last one, the blue color one, which is 15 Newton, you want this distance. From here to here is 4 centimeters. So twice that value would be 8 centimeter. So 8 centimeter will be 0 0.08 meter. So this one would be plus 50 times 0 0.08. Let's see whether we get the answer. 24 point multiplied by 0.24 plus 16 times 0.2 minus 13 times 0.13 plus 50 times 0 0.08. We are getting 9.3 Newton meter. Let's see whether do we have the answer here? Yes, we have. The answer by right should be C. Let's double check in case I'm wrong. This is June 17, P12. Okay, let me just have a quick look at it. Yeah, 
answer is C. Okay. So this is how you somehow add up moments or talks together. All right. So long as you have some idea of that, I think you should be fine. Okay. Ah, uh, yes, sir. All right. Okay. So this one should be it already. Okay. So I'll just clear off everything here and then I'll just move on a bit to the next part of your lessons, which deals on equilibrium. Okay. So equilibrium, this one, I think I can finish up all the way to page 10. There's something I will probably skip. Okay. Now, one of the main things in your chapter is about equilibrium. Okay. Now, Forces, you know, can cause a resultant force, which in turn causes an object to accelerate. Forces can also be in equilibrium. Rather than giving you a resultant force, we could also tell you that your forces are in equilibrium. Now, when we tell you forces acting on an object are in equilibrium, the object will either only remain stationary or move with constant velocity. Since F net is zero, therefore acceleration is zero, your velocity will just be constant. Okay. Now for an object to be in equilibrium, there are two main criteria. The first criteria being that the sum of forces in any direction must be equals to zero. This actually translates to sum of horizontal forces being zero, sum of vertical forces being zero, okay? Something that is in equilibrium will not have resultant force in any direction, okay? You add up all the forces in any direction, it will always be equals to zero, all right? This is the first criteria for an object to be in equilibrium. The second criteria for an object to be in equilibrium is that we'll tell you that the sum of moments about any point must be equal to zero. So no matter which point you pick, the sum of moments will be zero. No matter. So maybe I will get to standardize the language. The sum of moment will be equal to zero at any point. You could be given an object with maybe points A, B, C, D, and E. If the object is in equilibrium, if we tell you that the forces are in equilibrium, no matter which pivot you pick A, B, C, D, E, it will always be equal to zero. Okay, so result worded another way, resultant moment is zero about any point. Okay, so in equation terms, it is actually represented by this. So our fx equals to zero, sum of moment equals to zero. Okay, now in some past year questions that you do, you may sometimes hear them asking you about what is principle of moments. Okay, principle of moment actually is just telling you that for an object to be in equilibrium, the sum of moments about any point must be equal to zero. Okay, sum of moments about any point is equal to zero. That's all. If they ask you what is equilibrium, there are two criteria. Sum of forces in any direction is zero. Sum of moments about any point is zero. But if they just ask you about principle of moments, they're actually just referring to the moments part. The moments about any point must be equal to zero. Yeah, another thing I think I should probably might mention to you. Now, if you say that sum of forces is equal to z sum of forces about any point is equal to zero, which in turn gave you sum of fx equals to zero, sum of fy equals to zero. It can also be rewritten as this. If I talk about some of fx equals to zero, it could mean the rightward force is equal to the leftward force. If I tell you that the sum of vertical forces is zero, it could mean that the upward force is equal to the downward force. And then if I tell you that the sum of moments is equal to zero, it could also mean that clockwise moments is equals to anti-clockwise moment. Okay, some people tend to interpret it as this, which is actually the same as what you have here. But the formal definition is this now. It's just that when you do calculations, people tend to interpret it as what I wrote here in the green, uh, inside the green box. 
Okay. So if you tell if I tell you that sum of forces in the horizontal direction is zero, it's the same as you saying the rightwards force is equal to the leftwards force. If I tell you that the sum of vertical forces is zero, it means that the outward force is equal to the downward force. If we tell you that the sum of moments is equal to zero, that means clockwise moments equals anti-clockwise moments. Okay. Now, for your case here, if you look at the little diagram here, I'm just going to go through maybe point A and B here for you. Will these forces make the seesaw rotate or are there moments balanced? This one here, if I ask you to take moments about A, B, C, and D, you will eventually find out that the moments are actually equals to zero. But I'll just show you for point A first. Now, if I take moments about point A, there are actually four different points here that you can take as your pivot. A, B, C, D. Right now, we are just trying to determine whether this object is in equilibrium. And one of the ways in which we can do that is by determining the moments about any of those points. So if I take moments about point A, Let me just erase this one. If I take moments about point A, the force that I need to consider for moment calculation is just the 20 Newton force and the 40 Newton force. This force that you have here is not considered because you see it passes through the pivot. Just now earlier I mentioned to you, if the force passes through the pivot, you don't consider it inside your moment calculation because there's no perpendicular distance. So here you only consider the 20 Newton and the 14 Newton force. So right here, you see the 14 Newton force causes rotation clockwise, 20 Newton anti-clockwise. So one of them will minus the other. In order not to make things more complicated, I won't assign any sign convention here. I'll just tell you, you will see here that the moments are opposite. So one of them will be negative. One of them will be subtracting off. So this one will be 40 Newton multiplied by one meter perpendicular distance minus of 20 Newton multiplied with two meter perpendicular distance. You will see that the resultant moment is zero. Okay. Now if you try to repeat the same thing for B, for C, for D, you eventually come to the conclusion that the resultant moment is zero. So here, since the sum of moments about any point is zero, we would say that the seesaw is in equilibrium. Okay, so when you do the calculations, any force that passes through the pivot will not be considered because it does not produce movement about the chosen pivot. So for A just now, I told you specifically, this force here don't consider because it passes through the pivot. Okay, so this one, it won't really, uh, I won't talk so much about it because it doesn't really mean much. I want to talk more about the, what is on the next page, page nine, okay? Now, when we have something in equilibrium, just now I told you that there are a few conditions to it, right? The sum of forces must be equals to zero. The sum of moments must be equals to zero. If something is in equilibrium and you try to look at the forces acting on the diagram of the object, if the object is in equilibrium, the line of action of all the forces will intersect at a common point. Okay, if the forces all intersect at a common point, then the object is in equilibrium. This is another way of knowing whether an object is in equilibrium, other than doing calculations and seeing the sum of forces or sum of moments. An easy way is to look at the diagram and see whether the forces tend to intersect. If they intersect at a point, then it is in equilibrium. An example I can show you is this one here. You have a ladder. The last lesson we did an example on a ladder, remember? So here, this is a ladder, and we tell you that there are three forces acting on the ladder. You have number one, the weight, number two, the force from the ground, and then number three, the force from the wall. If you try to extend the line of action of these three forces, and it so happens that all three seems to intersect at a point, then this object is in equilibrium. Okay, this object, you notice, 
all the forces intersect at a point, this one is in equilibrium. Okay. Now it can also help you to determine the direction of forces when we tell you that something is in equilibrium. Say for example, right now, I tell you that I'm interested in this pole that's being hung from the wall right now. And I tell you that this that this object is in equilibrium. It's not moving, therefore it must be in equilibrium. So I want to find out the direction of some of the forces acting on this object right now. If I look at the pole itself, there's the weight of the pole acting on it. And then the cable is connected to the pole. The cable will exert a force onto the pole along the length of the cable itself. So you will have a tension in this direction. Now the pole is attached to the hinge. The pole is pushing onto the hinge. The hinge will push back onto the pole. But if I tell you that this object is in equilibrium and I'm interested in finding out what is the direction of this force acting on the hinge, you will make use of what I just mentioned. Forces in equilibrium will always intersect at a common point. So if you want to find out which direction does the force on the force from the hinge act directly, you will actually have to do some extrapolation. The weight, say x in the middle, you extend it outwards. The tension x along the length of the cable, you extend it along the length of the cable. If your object is to be in equilibrium, the force from the hinge must pass through a common point. You see the two other forces, tension and W, are already intersecting here. Therefore, the force from the hinge must also intersect that. So what you do is that you draw a line passing through that point here, going to your hinge. This one will tell you the direction of the force on your hinge. Okay. So this is one useful thing to know. Forces that are in equilibrium, if you extend the line of action, they will tend to intersect at a common point. Okay. All right, so this one is okay. Yes, sir. All right, so then there's also another thing here that I can also mention to you. For non-parallel forces that act in equilibrium, oh yeah, this is one thing I should mention. This one is only for non-parallel forces only, okay? You could have example of cases where the forces are parallel, but the object is in equilibrium. If I give you an example of a seesaw, okay, if I give you an example of a seesaw, right, like this one here, like the previous example, I tell you that the forces are in equilibrium, the object is balanced. I could have force F1, I could have force F2, and then I could have force F3. This thing here can also be in equilibrium. Can also be in equilibrium where I tell you that the sum of forces fx is zero, sum of fy is zero, and the sum of moment is zero. This one here can also be a case where the object is in equilibrium, but you notice that here because the forces are parallel in the first place, no matter how you extend the line of action of the force, it will never intersect. Okay. So, but that doesn't mean that this object cannot be in equilibrium. It can still be in equilibrium, provided that you are able to prove this, okay? The one that I show you here, where you extend the line of action of the force such that it intersects at a common point is for non-parallel forces only. If the forces are non-parallel, they will always intersect at equilibrium, okay? Right, so this is one part. The other part also for non-parallel forces, again, is that if the object is in equilibrium, these forces, when drawn in a vector diagram, head to tail, will form a closed vector diagram. What do I mean by that? Is something like this. Uh, let me clear off everything here. If, let's just say I have an object, this one here, and I tell you I have forces F1, F2, and F3 acting on it. 
in chapter one, if I ask you to find out what is the resultant force acting on this object, you would have probably say, draw the vectors from head to tail, right? So let's just say I draw the vectors from head to tail, F1, and then say F2, and then after that I draw F3, Okay, maybe I draw it bigger so that it's easier to see. If I draw the vectors F1 and then F2 followed by F3. Now, what you learned in the first chapter was that if I told you that there are a number of forces acting on this object and then I ask you to find the resultant, you know that you will draw the vectors from head to tail. Any gap that remains is actually your resultant. And the direction will be given from the first point to last point. If this one is your initial, and then this one is your last point, sorry, this one is your initial, and this one is your final point, the direction of your resultant will be like this. This is your FR. This one, if object is not in equilibrium there is resultant force okay indicated by this red line here okay now the length of that red line indicates to you the magnitude of your resultant force now you would agree that if the length of the red line decreases, that means your resultant decreases, right? Likewise, if the length of your red line increases, that means your resultant increases, right? So you imagine this, if the FR here, the red line represents your resultant, when an object is in equilibrium, there's no resultant. That means this red line won't even exist, okay? So, when you were to, if you were to draw the vectors from head to tail, again, if it's in equilibrium, the diagram you will get would be something like this instead. This is F1, this is F2, and then the, this is F3. There's no gap. If you draw it from head to tail to scale, there is no gap, the vector, closes up so no resultant therefore in equilibrium okay so here you're also trying to draw a scale vector diagram for the vectors from head to tail but this time when you draw it you notice that you're not getting any gap the vectors will close up so when the vectors close out, that means there's no resultant here. The object is in equilibrium. If in chapter one, you did the same thing, you draw the vectors from head to tail, and then you notice there's a gap there. That gap is your resultant. Okay? So that's why here we will tell you that if you have forces that are in equilibrium, and then you try to draw them to scale from head to tail, if they form a closed vector triangle, sorry, closed vector diagram, meaning to say they close up, no gaps, that one will be telling you that your object is in equilibrium, okay? That's what I'm, uh, there's another way of seeing whether something is in equilibrium. If they form a closed vector diagram, no gaps, okay? Can you understand that point first? Ah, uh, yes, sir. Okay, right. So this one is another way of determining whether an object is in equilibrium okay so we look at the example here all right we look at the example here and probably will be able to end the lesson okay so look at the next example uh page 10 okay now a rod pq is attached at p to a vertical wall as shown in the diagram below the length of the rod is 1.6 meter the weight w of the rod x 0.64 meter from p the rod is kept horizontal and in equilibrium by a wire attached to Q and to the wall at R. The wire provides a force F on the rod 
of 44 Newton at 30 degrees to the horizontal. Determine the magnitude of weight W. Okay. Right, so if you look at the case right now, they told you that you have weight W, the magnitude is unknown, you have tension in the wire, which also acts on the rod, whose value is 44 Newton, and angle 30 degrees to the bar. They want you to determine the weight W of the object, noting that this bar is in equilibrium. Now, there are actually three forces acting on this bar right now, the weight, the tension F, and also an unknown reaction force here. This one, let's just say, is R. La, okay? Because you see the bar, the rod is pressing onto the wall by right, the, road, the wall will press back on to the rod. There's an unknown force here. This one is an unknown. So now you are asked to determine the magnitude of weight W. Now, one of the common ways in which you can do this is that Notice that this thing is in equilibrium. So there are usually a few criteria that comes to mind. Sum of fx is equals to zero. Sum of fy is equals to zero. Sum of moments is equals to zero. Usually when something is in equilibrium and you're required to calculate something out of it, you will have to use this, okay? So right now to determine the magnitude of weight w, the easiest thing you can do now is actually to take moments. Okay, remember that some of moments at any point is equals to zero. So what you do now is that you take moments about P. Okay, you take moments about P. This is now your pivot. You only need to consider the moment caused by weight W and F. If you take moments about P, moment caused by R does not need to be considered. Okay, this is just a statement. Uh. You don't really need to write this in your formal workings, all right? I'm just telling you right now, I'm taking moments about P so that moment caused by R does not need to be considered because R itself is unknown. I don't want to make my calculation more complicated by adding more unknowns. I only need to find the unknown W. So R being another unknown, I don't want to add it in. So I purposely pick P as my pivot so that I don't need to consider the moment caused by R. So if I take moments about P, that will mean that sum of moments about P is equal to zero. Now, remember I told you that this one can also mean that clockwise moment equals to anti-clockwise moment. There are two ways to look about it. Let me just show you two different ways. Okay, if I tell you some moments about P is equal to zero, let's just say I establish a sign convention, clockwise is positive. If you look at the moment caused by weight W, it will be clockwise, it will be positive. The moment caused by force F, because you see it's a diagonal force, you have to resolve it. This one will be F. This one, I already know the force. This one will be 44 sine 30. This one will be 44, cos 30. But this one, you see, it again passes through the pivot. So this one, don't need to consider. No need to consider inside calculation because it passes through pivot, okay? 44 cos 30, so no, no, don't need to consider. All right, you only consider the 44 sine 30. The 44 sine 30, you will notice that 
with respect to point P, it causes a rotation like this. This one will be negative moment. So now if you try to sum up the moments all together, this one, sum of moments of P is zero, clockwise moments is equals to zero, you will get W times 0 0.64, minus with 44 sine 30 times with 1.6. Where did I get the 0 0.64? The 0 0.64 is here because this is your perpendicular distance. Where did I get the 1.6? Is from here. The question already mentioned that the length of the row is 1.6. Okay, so this one you see is equals to zero. Eventually, your weight, you calculate it as 44 sine 30 times 1.6 divided by 0.64. You will get it as 55 Newton. Okay, this one is if you use it as this. But recall that I also mentioned that sometimes you can also just write it as this. Clockwise moment equals to anti-clockwise moment. Here, just now, you already identify your clockwise moment as this. This one will just be W times 0 0.64. Your anti-clockwise moment is this. This one will just be 44 sine 30 44 sine 30 times with 1.6. Your W will also still be 55 Newton. Same answer like what you have before. So sometimes you might notice in my working, I do it like this and then straight away write it as this. Sometimes you may also notice that your own teacher in KTJ or my other workings may sometimes write it as this. They're basically the same thing. Because if you see here, this part here actually represented clockwise moments. This part here actually represented anti-clockwise moments. If I shift this one here, the negative will get eliminated. That's why I get this. Okay, so it's actually the same thing. They're all from the same thing, actually. It's just the matter in which you express them. Okay, so this one, the W will be 55 Newton. Okay, so far so good. Yes, sir. All right. Okay, the last, um, for part B, draw an arrow on the figure above to represent the force acting on the rod at P. Okay, so I'm just going to erase whatever I have here. They want you to draw an arrow on the figure above to represent the force acting on the rod at P. So just now, as I mentioned, there's an unknown force P here, which I do not know. I don't know the magnitude, I do not know the direction, but the question now is asking you to draw the direction of that force. So, as I mentioned to you, for non-parallel forces, if the forces are in equilibrium, they will all intersect at the common point. So, you know W, you know F here, what you do is you, in, you extend the line of action, you will notice that the intersection is here, isn't it? So that unknown force from P, you draw that line from P, make sure it passes through this intersection point. This will be the direction of your unknown force at P. Okay. All right. Okay, so this one is all right. Then the last one, draw a vector diagram for the forces acting on the rod next to the given figure. You don't need to draw it to scale. If I want to represent all these forces here in a vector diagram, how would it look like? Doesn't need to be to scale, just give me a rough approximation. It will actually look something like this. This one will be W, this one would be R, and then this one will be F. It should be a close vector triangle or diagram. Now. Okay, both mean the same thing. Triangle is just a more 
specific term to it. Okay. okay. This one means no resultant. No gaps, yes. no resultant. 